the grantees. I'm Randall Mullen with TDA Consulting, and I will further introduce myself and the co-presenter momentarily. Before we begin the presentation of the content, I first want to cover a few logistics. If you participated in similar webinars, you probably know this detail. All participants uh, will be muted during the webinar so that you will participate in listen mode. You probably already received a copy of this PowerPoint presentation, as is customary. The slide deck will also be available on the HUD exchange after the webinar. Uh, these slides and the related resources will appear on the cohort landing page that you see in the right side of this slide. And I'm going to actually uh, demonstrate to you where you would find the materials. And we also urge you to vis visit that landing page and join the CPF mailing list. Uh, this will enable you to receive notifications and obtain grant support. Uh, you, you may simply um, follow the instructions that I'm about to give you, and I will immediately now share the website and we'll go there together. This is the Community Project Funding, funding landing page, and you will scroll down here and obtain resources in regard to your cohort seven, which is part of the FY23 cohorts, and to subscribe to the CPF mailing list, you will click here at the bottom of that landing page, and I will show you what that brings up. You can see here how you subscribe to the HUD Exchange mailing lists, and I will note that there are numerous lists. You want to add the one that is related to the community project funding grants, and you will look that they, these uh, listings are alphabetized and the community project funding grants are actually uh, listed as part of the EDI, that's the Economic Development Initiative dash CPF community project funding grants, as you see right here, where the, the box is uh, colored in blue. Now we'll go back and continue with, with the presentation. Although you will participate in listen mode, we will want for you to become actively engaged. Uh, you may submit content related questions using the chat feature of Zoom, sending those questions to everyone. Uh, the co-presenter and I will monitor the chat and answer clarifying questions when possible as they are asked. And we will also pause at the end of each section of today's webinar uh, read aloud those frequently asked questions and and ask um, for for further clarification as necessary from HUD representatives who will join us. We also have reserved, as usual, a dedicated time period for questions and answers toward the end of the presentation. And, and there we will also invite HUD representatives to answer the more difficult questions or clarify answers that uh, we presenters might provide uh, to earlier responses as, as necessary. Here's the agenda that we'll follow today. As I mentioned, we'll begin with introductions followed by an overview of the cohort, the, a general description of today's topic project narrative and cover its format as well as specific content related to project descriptions, metrics, time, timeline and status, and proposed subrecipients. After we cover those content areas, we'll actually do an activity followed by the question and answer period I mentioned, and we'll orally address questions that have not been previously answered in the chat at that time. Uh, lastly, we'll, we'll provide you, yes, you're going to hear this correctly, with a homework assignment and urge you to complete it before the next session that will occur in about two weeks time. 
I'll begin the introductions and then tag my co-presenter who will introduce himself and in turn tag HUD representatives who are joining us today. Again, my name is Randall Mullen and I'm with TDA Consulting where I've worked for many years, both as vice president and as a senior consultant on a wide range of housing and community development projects. I've recently assisted HUD in explaining guidance around special congressional appropriations. Uh, that work has included both recovery from natural disasters and response to the COVID-19 pandemic, plus recovery from its associated economic impacts, and now the CPF program. The co-presenter today is Chad Carson. Chad, will you please introduce yourself? Thanks, Randall. Um... As you said, my name is Chad Carson. I am with Civics and am looking forward to running through this narrative session with you all. I've been working in this uh, federal funding space for about a decade in a bunch of different capacities, uh, primarily around housing, um, and looking forward to working with you all. And let me uh, introduce Connor with HUD. Hey everyone, my name is Connor Leroux. I'm a program analyst with the Congressional Grants Division. Uh, I primarily work to help develop the uh, technical assistance projects, such as these cohort sessions that you're on. Um, and I also work as a systems officer. So um, assisting some of your grant officers with their portfolio of grantees as it relates to DRGR system access and troubleshoot. And I believe we have a grant officer on, uh, Eileen Barnhart, if she wants to jump on and introduce herself. Hi, I'm Eileen Barnhart. I'm one of the grant officers and here to answer any questions that uh, you may have. And I wish you all a great session today. All right. Thank you, Eileen and Connor, as well as Chad. The CPF cohort is assembled for us to provide specific guidance that will assist you in the satisfactory completion of all the necessary grant materials. You were invited to join this cohort, as I mentioned earlier, on the basis of your award of a CPF grant. Session one today will specifically assist you with the completion of the required information that leads to executing your grant agreement beginning with the project narrative. And this will enable you to turn your attention eventually after you complete all of the sessions of your grant materials. And then uh, those you will be able to proceed in implementing your special project. Today's session on, on project narrative is the first of four sessions. You, you see here that at two week intervals, you will also be uh, attending sessions on the budget, the environmental review, as well as the necessary forms to be submitted with your grant package. Uh, the additional sessions uh, will also be accompanied by office hours sessions, which we will mention toward the end of this presentation. To facilitate this cohort, you've been enrolled in a learning management system called Absorb, which is hosted by TDA Consulting. Uh, this system will eventually extend beyond the delivery of this presentation uh, and the other three sessions. The LMS feature will include useful resources as well as serve as a platform uh, for a future interaction with cohorts. We'll now turn our attention to the key narrative content areas that Chad and I will go over. Uh, I will briefly discuss the project description, and then Chad will cover the other areas you see listed here. If you're just starting to complete the grant materials, or maybe you've been working on them a while, you probably realize there's no prescribed format for the project narrative. It's understandable that, that you might get stuck along the way. All the required content will cover roughly several typewritten pages. However, HUD recognizes that you will begin with essentially a blank page, and that itself can be a challenge for either starting or, or completing the project narrative. 
Our best advice, of course, is to refer to the CPF instructions you've received with your award letter, as well as the CPF grant guide for FY23 grantees, which details the required content for your grant submission. Uh, you may also refer to the standard form used for federal grant applications, that is the SF-424, and you may use this presentation as an outline for drafting your narrative section. The graphic appearing on this slide, as well as the presentation Chad and I are delivering, uh, follows an outline structure that you may adapt for your project narrative. Again, it's not a prescribed format, but it will be useful, particularly if you haven't started yet. Those who have already begun probably recognize that the outline closely aligns with the CPF grant guide for FY23 grantees. Okay, we'll now discuss the, the detailed content of the project description, beginning with the narrative, including your project's name, address, purpose, and details that will round out what would be considered a full narrative. A satisfactory project description begins with the seemingly simple task of identifying your community's project name. The project name and other descriptive information must encompass the full scope of the project in its entirety. This is essential for HUD to review your grant package and the related materials. You will also need to obtain that information to inform the level of environmental review necessary to gain clearance of your project. And that information must tie back to and match the Joint Explanatory Statement, or the JES, of the Congressional Appropriation, unless it is corrected or amended. I'll elaborate on this last point momentarily. Because there are literally thousands of these community project funding grants, since Congress resumed appropriating funds for such uses, the description must precisely identify the project location. You must provide an address if that's available, Otherwise, GPS coordinates are acceptable. Uh, you will see in this example that we've actually planted a stake in the center of Washington, D.C., using its coordinates in that they may be recognized by HUD representatives with us today. You're also encouraged to include a map depicting the site of the project if that enhances your project description. The narrative must also clearly describe your project's purpose. This may be as simple as a one-sentence summary describing what the project seeks to accomplish. However, in all cases, you absolutely must use language for, for the project scope that appears in the congressional record as part of the JES. For example, if the JES describes construction of Gateway Plaza in your community, the narrative should also describe a proposed appropriation of funds for the construction of Gateway Plaza. HUD has provided these examples on the, the slide showing now, which are acceptable purpose statements appearing in a submitted grant package. The first, the Community Foundation of Illinois will construct a 12,000 square foot community center in Peoria, Illinois. The city of Omaha will launch a Main Street revitalization program, renovating the facades of historic storefronts on East Main Street. And thirdly, the town of Gatlinburg will create an updated storm water management plan. The full narrative then may summarize the entire project, restating the purpose and most importantly, identifying activity categories and the specific uses of the grant. Examples on this slide illustrate that point. But first, I want to emphasize that you must describe 
all actions that will be undertaken as part of your project, regardless of the funding source. HUD recognizes many projects will benefit from other sources of funding, which contribute to the full scope and impact of your project. As such, this content area comprises the bulk of the narrative. Now, what are these examples that appear below item four? They're common activities categories for a wide range of housing development projects, affordable rental housing, capacity building, community clearance and, and demolition, public facilities rehabilitation or reconstruction, economic development, and so forth. Use these activity categories or others like them because they will be helpful in the eventual setup of your project within HUD's DRGR management information system once your grant agreement is signed and the funds can be sent, spent. When you finish drafting the project narrative, we do advise you to sit back, ask yourself these three questions which cover the topics of particularly significant content. One, did you include the congressional award language? Two, what pre-award costs, if any, are you seeking to reimburse under your grant agreement? And three, was a federal environmental review completed prior to starting? Lastly, I want to mention the possibility of technical corrections to the congressional appropriation. As this slide indicates, if the JES had an error or if the project has perhaps substantially changed since announcement, some projects will require technical correction. You should discuss any such issues with the grantee name, project name, or description with your grant officer. And if a technical correction has been made, you would describe that change including the specific change and the reason it was needed. Okay, that's it for the project narrative part of this presentation. I'll now turn the remainder of this presentation over to Chad. Chad? All right, thanks, Randall. Let me just get my screen share going here. There we go. All right, I'm going to be speaking about the metrics first that you need to develop into your narrative. So every approved narrative needs to have uh, clearly stated goals and outcomes. HUD leaves this up to grantees to determine what best describes your, um, your own outcomes. And it lets you make them tailored to your specific project. Um, they just need to be quantifiable and they need to accurately encapsulate what you are trying to achieve. So just a few examples here. Hold six community meetings to gather feedback on a city plan. Construct 10 miles of walking path or train 60 small business owners. So you can see in all of those, it's measurable. And that is... Uh, the most important part. Now, the next slide is about section three performance measures. Um, this slide is a little tricky to explain, so please bear with me. Um, but CPF grantees need to comply with section three of the Housing and Urban Development Act of 1968, which directs um, HUD funding towards um, targeted workers, disadvantaged workers in the communities where a project is being implemented. Uh, specifically, it covers grants that involve construction. So that could be housing rehab, housing construction, or other public construction projects. But in general, if you're building something, it's going to be covered by Section 3. Now, in your narrative, you don't need to put in your performance measures for Section 3, but you should identify whether or not Section 3 applies to your project. 
once you get access to DRGR, that's the HUD system for reporting that this program will use, you will need to enter estimated hours of total labor hours, section three labor hours, and targeted section three labor hours. But that's not, that doesn't need to be a part of your narrative. This is just a, a heads up for something that is to come. If you have any questions about whether or not your project is covered by section three, um, it would be great if you spoke to your grant officer about that. Um, and we'll talk about resources to get answers for things like that later on. Another uh, compliance item is the Build America, Buy America Act, uh, commonly shortened to BABA. Uh, BABA requires that uh, all iron, steel, manufactured products and construction materials for federally funded infrastructure, infrastructure projects are produced here in the USA. Um, examples of infrastructure projects are in that blue box on the right. I'm not gonna read through them all, but it commonly maps out to what you would think of as infrastructure. Um, now, the most important part here is that HUD has a waiver for fiscal year 2023 grantees from BABA requirements. So if your only source of funds, if your only source of federal funds on the uh, CPF project that you're undertaking is fiscal year 2023 CPF funding, then you don't have to worry about BABA. You can use that waiver. But if you are anticipating the use of additional federal uh, sources, uh, such as CPF funds from 2024 or beyond, or any other federal source that comes with a BABA requirement, then you need to make sure that your whole project is compliant with Build America, Buy America Act. But again, if uh, your only source of funding is this, if your only source of federal funding is this um, program, this grant program, then you can take advantage of the waiver. And we've got linked there a, a quick guide from uh, the CPF program on what is BABA, what it's applicable to, and uh, how to comply. The next area is timeline and project status. So built into your narrative, you need to explain the current status of your project. Uh, providing that lets your grant officer know uh, what resources you might need, um, what milestones you might be uh, nearing, and generally gives them guidance on how best to assist you with uh, compliance. So just include an explanation of where in the project it currently is in its lifespan. That could be anywhere from uh, conception, it's just an idea at this point, and a grant, <laughs> um, or it could be in the procurement stage. Maybe you're hiring um, a firm to implement the project. Maybe construction has already started. And if it has, we need to make sure that you're covered for environmental review, which is on a later slide. Um, or even is it complete? Just whatever the current status is, build that into your project, uh, into your narrative. You also want to include an estimated start date and completion date for your project. Um, that's pretty self-explanatory. We know that these are an estimate at this stage, and that's totally fine. All right, that promised environmental review slide. So uh, projects within this program are subject to the National Environmental Policy Act, that's NEPA. And under NEPA, you need to get environmental clearance for any projects that you're undertaking. Um, the degree and type of environmental review depends on what your project is. But what's most important here is that you are relaying what, if anything, have you done so far to get your project environmentally cleared? You just want to give the status of that. Um, and at this stage, it's totally OK if you've done nothing, provided that you also haven't started the project. Um, or maybe you've already completed your environmental review. Um, that's great, too. The, the important thing here is just to relay what's going on with environmental review with respect to the project. If you have questions about this, 
uh, please reach out to your grant officer or we have the resource of your HUD regional environmental officer who can assist. We've got a link there to the staff contact page for these HUD OEE staff. And we'll look at that uh, a little bit further down the road on the resources slide. The last content area is proposed subrecipients. Um, some of you might want to implement your project using subrecipients. Um, subrecipients are essentially if you want to pass down some of the money to um, a governmental entity or a nonprofit to implement some of the project, you can do that, provided um, you give a justification for why it's best to implement it um, in that way, and you outline the role of each subrecipient and the scope of what you will do versus what the subrecipient will do. Um, make sure you clearly identify um, all of the parties involved there. Now, I do want to distinguish this a little bit from contractors. So subrecipients are selected um, and are either nonprofits or governmental entities. Um, contractors are um, people, businesses that you are procuring through a competitive process. Um, so a local government might be a subrecipient or um, a local social services nonprofit could be a subrecipient. An example of a contractor instead would be um, the builder that you are uh, going to hire to complete some infrastructure work or a consulting firm that's going to provide technical assistance. Um, for the narrative, we're just focused on the subrecipients in that equation, not contractors. Chad, before you advance to the next slide, we do have a few questions concerning what you've covered as well as what I've covered. Uh, shall we try to answer those questions? Yeah. Okay. One concerns what I think would, would fall under metrics, and I've attempted to answer the question, but you're in a better position. Uh, Beth states, we are upgrading over 30,000 lights citywide pretty large number. Is the project description uh, citywide sufficient for the address? And then I also thought that they might want to relate that to, to the, the metric. And what, um, what I have indicated in response to another question uh, where the location isn't completely defined is that um, they, Beth, as well as the other uh, person, Karen, would want to identify as in as much as, in as much detail as possible the location, the geographic area, and if it is citywide, try to to provide at least examples of of where it, uh, the the street lights would would be upgraded and thereby confirming that the locations are within your city limits because the community project funding is awarded um, to, to certain um, entities and the intent of Congress is for it to be spent there. But uh, could you comment also, it, it strikes me that that um, 30,000 lights is probably also useful information uh, as a metric. Would, would that Absolutely. That's a great metric. Um, install 30,000 or retrofit 30,000 um, light poles. That's a great uh, description of what you'll be doing um, and a great uh, metric. And I agree with Randall. Definitely don't want you to put in 30,000 addresses. Um, if you could um, potentially plot them um, in GIS and provide a map, that would be great. Um, Randall's idea of examples is also great, um, including a boundary map of your city um, yeah. would also be uh, helpful. Anything to give some indications that your grant officer um, can understand the project. Yes, and Karen asked a similar question. If uh, we do not have exact locations identified, can we describe the project and state specific locations uh, will be identified at a later time? 
and updates will be provided. And, and what I indicated is, uh, again, you would need to identify at least the potential locations to the great extent possible, um, because again, you want to establish that the use of the funds will benefit the community to which the award is made as expressed by the intent of Congress. Uh, you could confer with your grant officer about how to appropriately describe your project. Uh, Karen, you've not indicated what, what the project actually in, entails. Your grant officer can probably uh, steer you in, in the right direction. And I'd welcome now uh, either Connor or Eileen to add to or, or uh, clarify whatever um, their understanding is uh, in relation to these questions and both Chad's and my, my responses. Connor or Eileen, can you address these project location questions? Hi, this is Eileen. I just want to let you know it is a requirement. We must have a project address. So while you're determining that, we do have sometimes we have projects that come in and sometimes we just have an area. So that's where it's like the coordinates can be helpful because you don't have like if, a, if you're developing an area, you may not have a street address as of yet. So that would be acceptable, um, but that will be needed. And i um, not sure what else. Well, how about the... Um the citywide uh, streetlight replacement program. That, that's um, one of the two questions that came up. They're upgrading uh, over 30,000 lights citywide. Right. Is description citywide sufficient to for the address? Well, I would I'd put down the city and then in your SF424 on line 14, you'd do citywide and you might want to say, maybe you might need to put in the boundaries yes um so that you would know if like if say you're doing this within a city um you know you'd say what the, the boundaries are with the city the city limits build the city limits on a map yeah okay and we have another question uh, maybe a follow-up from karen uh we're going to purchase or construct tiny homes for affordable housing that will be placed throughout the city. And we have not identified the exact sites yet. So in that instance, you're going to be executing the activity. You might want to use your main address and then for your, um, you know, sites to be determined because you're going to be acquiring, I assume you're going to be acquiring property or you're acquiring and then putting the little houses on that's my guess. Um, and then in your environmental review, you'll have to do a two-tiered review. One will be for the activity, to conduct that activity, and then you'll have to get the more specific when you have the uh, properties identified. So at some point in time, you'll have to have identified properties that you're going to be using. But in, initially, you could put for this activity your main address. And there again, that's why you would want to be in touch with your grant officer because one Absolutely. can better identify the locations or, or perhaps the city has identified uh, priority locations that will be um, identified for constructing the, those tiny homes um, for affordable housing that they would be um, represented and, and give the reviewers a bit more information to not only confirm that the, the tiny homes will be constructed in uh, the community for, for which the funds were awarded, but but also you're referring to them, you know, being affordable housing, and and you would ideally, you know, say that they're responding to to a market uh, demand in those certain selected areas of the city. Do we have any other questions, Chad? No, that's. That's all we've received so far. So we'll keep on going and all feel right. free to continue adding questions as you think of them. Okay. So Hi, this is, this is Melissa. I came on a little bit late. I was running late from another meeting. So I apologize um, for just uh, blurring out and not writing my question in the chat. But I do have a question with regards to um, the HUD funding. What happens if the project moves to a different location and a different address? And that would be after you've submitted your narrative 
and got your Correct. credit agreement approved? Correct. I would, Ar Arlene, that would involve. Uh, I would immediately the contact the grant officer yeah. because that um, that that could potentially be a change in the scope of work. Right. If you're changing yeah, the so, location, so I would con I would contact the grant officer and proceed from there. I don't want to misadvise you. Yeah. So we did contact um, the grant advisor, and they have a new staff person, and so she was new to this, and so I guess she didn't really know what to do as well. Okay. Um, send the can you send your message to Connor, and then we'll we'll accelerate it. Sure. Can you put Connor's email address on the chat or in the chat? Connor, would you mind putting their information in? Thank you, Connor. Okay. And uh, yeah, I had said that y'all were <laughs> being muted. So I'm, I'm kind of surprised that you were able to get through, Melissa. But thank you for your, your question, as well as thanks to both Karen and to Beth uh, for their questions. It is time for an activity now, and what we would like to do is, is set up that activity related to project description and then engage your participation. Appearing on this slide is a sample project description. Uh, as I explained earlier, a grantee's project description should identify the exact activity, entire scope, sources of funding, and the other details that tie back to the congressional appropriation. The column on the left identifies a project with a very long name, the Community Watershed Education and Freshwater Mussel Hatchery. I will refer to it simply as the Fish Hatchery Project. And it's commonly referred to as a project of Bertram's Garden. The grantee has highlighted, uh, or I have highlighted the grantee's summary that indicates funds will design and construct a new watershed education and restoration complex on previously acquired land. That's highlighted just below the project summary and you will, will see those words will design and construct the facility on previously acquired land at Bertram's Gardens. The center column is a page from the congressional record, and it lists the joint explanatory statements, a, a few of them, appropriating funds for the set of awards that you see listed here. And the first on this list is the CWEFM hatchery or the fish hatchery project offered or, or funded for Bertram, the John Bertram Association at, in a particular state that's not identified and, and a funding award of $2 million. And what do we see in that first column of the congressional record, the joint explanatory statement for the Bertram's Gardens project? The fish hatchery dash land acquisition. And the question here is does that match um, the, the, does their narrative on the left side match the joint explanatory statement in the congressional record or specifically the intent of Congress for the use of their funding award of $2 million. And we're going to put up a poll in just one second for y'all to respond to. That's right. Um, the question posed to you, as, as Chad's suggesting, is what is the appropriate grantee action in this case? There are three possible choices. The, the first in red is to submit the project description with the grant application as it is written and with the reference to the JES in the congressional record. The second action would be to contact the grant officer for guidance. 
And then the third possible action would be to request that a member of Congress intervene. And what would, we would like for you to do now is to respond to poll question, the, a poll question about the grantee action that you would take if you represented Bertram's Gardens and were handling the fish hatchery improvement project with the $2 million CPF grant award. So let's launch the poll and see what your responses are to the question of what is the correct grantee action. And Chad, we have about 60 participants in today's webinar. So let's try to get responses from roughly um, two thirds of them. Okay, we have a large number of participants who have selected choice B, contact the grant officer for guidance. A few have indicated A, submit the project description with the grant application. Uh, no one has yet indicated C, request that a member of Congress intervene. Oh, come on. You don't want to phone your congressman for this one? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've got 72% uh, in, so I'm going to end the poll. We do, yes. And the overwhelming majority of you did select to contact your grant officer. So we can stop the poll, and uh, you may advance to the next slide for us to identify and discuss the correct answer. Uh, to summarize our, our discussion on the activity, we determined that the narrative for Bertram Gardens is complete. Uh, it, it covers the elements of the project description. And of course, you were seeing only a highlighted part of that description, the part that was most essential, because it's the part that identifies the activity categories and should correspond with the joint economic statement that is the JES in the congressional record. Because HUD must execute grants in accordance with congressional intent conveyed through the grantee's name and the, that project description such as it is in the JES, um, action is necessary to correct what is a discrepancy. The joint explanatory statement, the intent of Congress appears to be for Bertram Gardens to use $2 million awarded to that location, that community for the purchase of land to establish the fish hatchery complex. And consequently, there is a discrepancy that would need to be addressed. And, and as such, uh, the correct answer is to contact the grant officer, as most of you did identify. Uh, this may lead to changes in the project description before it's submitted with the grant application. Uh, requesting a member of Congress to intervene would, would only complicate things at that point. If it is viewed to, to be a, a significant change and a technical corrections involved, that member of Congress could be, become involved at a later time. But at the point in preparing the grant materials, particularly the project narrative and the application itself, the correct action is for Bertram Gardens to contact its grant officer and obtain guidance in regard to this matter. I'll stop there, Chad, and see if uh, any questions or comments came in uh, as I was setting up, asking the question, or, or then uh, reporting. Cherie did ask a question, and I answered it in the chat, but it would be good just to touch on for everybody. Uh, okay. She asked, Go ahead. Uh, in building a new playground, should the... Uh, metric be around what's cons being constructed or around the outcome in the children's physical activity? Good question. Um, great question, because I know you're definitely targeting uh, physical activity there. 
um, for an outcome, but I would suggest uh, going with what you can uh, most easily tangibly measure. Um, and that's going with construction. So it could be construct, um, you know, an X acre playground or install playground equipment at Y sites, something like that. And Sherry yeah. was already doing that because uh, she's a good grantee. <laughs> well, what Sherry's described too is uh, what could be the project purpose, which does refer or should refer to the intended uh, outcome or or community benefit of the, of the project. But in respect to the matrix, what you're saying, Chad, is absolutely correct. Uh, there, the details should should be more more measurable, and and so uh, it, it would be important to to provide that that information as as chad indicated yep and, and unless we're putting fitbits on all the kids um that's <laughs> not super measurable so right okay if there are no other questions we can continue to our q a period or the resources i'm sorry all right um so we've got several resources here for you and i'm gonna uh share them on the screen as i go through them so the first um Hopefully by now all of you have been in touch with your grant officer or at least know who they are. Um, if you don't, you can uh, use this link here to find out who they are. Let me just open that up. I'll show you what it looks like. So it's a PDF here. Uh, you can see on the left side, it, the assignments for your CPF grant officer are split up by state. Um, so just read across the chart for your state and you'll see the most recent, um, most accurate assignee for your grant officer. If you continue across the chart, you'll see who your regional environmental officer is. Um, those email addresses um, are a great way to contact your regional environmental officer, but I'll show you another way too as we go through these resources. All right, let's look at the next one. All right, the next one is a great resource. It is the CPF program website. So this is your portal to all things CPF. And um, it's a great place to start with any questions that you might have. Um, if you're just starting out, I would work on familiarizing yourself with the resources that are here. Um, one of the most uh, critical pieces here is highlighted right here on the left, this CPF grant guides. And that's actually the next resource we had on the slide. So the grant guides um, are issued by fiscal year grantees, um, as in there's one guide for the 2022 grantees and one guide for the 2023 grantees. Um, in general, this should be 2023 grantees on the phone on this call. So make sure you download the correct one. Um, I know that there's, you see version one and version two here, don't be fooled. Um, there is a version one and two of uh, the 2022 version, but for the 2023 version, there's just a version one and that's the one that you want. And I will show you just real briefly what that looks like. Uh, it's about 50 pages of material and it goes uh, soup to nuts about how to get through the award process um, and all of the compliance requirements there. Um, it's a great place to start and uh, will really help you speed along through to getting to a signed grant agreement. 
All right, the next one is HUD's regional environmental officer contacts. So on the first sheet that I showed you, it had your environmental officer contacts just with the email address, but in the event that you need their phone number, that is here. Um, unlike the easy to read PDF from the first uh, resource, this is split up by HUD region. So if you're not familiar with what HUD region you're in, uh, there's a little cheat sheet right here it says which states belong to that region. So you can see region one is Connecticut, Massachusetts, um, ME, Maine, um, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, Vermont. And as you click through them, you can see the different states. So just make sure that you're contacting the appropriate person for uh, where your project is located. And then the last resource that I want to show is this HUD Ask a Question desk, or AAQ, as we like to call it. Um, this is essentially like a, a help desk ticket process. So if you um, need to escalate an issue, um, let's say you're having trouble getting in touch with your grant officer, or um, if your grant officer was stumped, like we saw uh, or heard from one uh, participant in the call, feel free to support or to submit a ticket here. You just are putting in your information and it ends up into um, the database and it is tracked by the program and by HUD management to make sure that you get um, your issues addressed. So first, of course, you wanna be dealing with your grant officer, but in the event that you've got a tricky question or have hit some obstacle that your grant officer hasn't been able to resolve for you, feel free to use this tool to reach out um, to the higher ups. And let me just get back to my slide deck. And Chad, as you're navigating back to the slide deck, uh, we do want to stress the importance of using the AAQ, that is the CPF help desk to address any issue or question that you might have. And, and we specifically have understood from HUD that they would like to know where a grantee uh, may be having difficulty getting in touch with a grant officer. As you might know, uh, Congress has appropriated funds for literally thousands of CPF grants after having not done so for, for decades. And now uh, the Department of HUD is gearing up to handle a very large number and the grant officers are quite busy. They also will occasionally change. And so what we would urge you to do is you, if you contact the grant officer who's named on that current list and you don't receive a, an answer in the time frame you you expect, ask a question about how to get in touch with that grant officer in the chat, I'm, I'm sorry, in the uh, AAQ question at that desk. And as Chad indicated, the question will, will be escalated to those responsible for the program and they will take steps to ensure that you are contacted by, by a, a grant officer and your issues can, can be fully addressed. All right, so last resource I wanna mention is the CPF desk guides, and these are still coming soon. These are a tool that we're developing based on the feedback that we get from grantees in these cohort sessions. So we appreciate all the questions you're asking. We're going to use them to, uh, build out these guides that will be a helpful tool to bid on. Um, thanks for the questions. That's where they're going. And we're going to pause here for questions and answers. I see that some uh, questions have come in. 
They so, have, and they particularly relate to what I had just mentioned and uh, uh, maybe a follow-up question too. And maybe I would think maybe Eileen might be in the best position to, to help answer uh, the questions. One concerned, um, the, uh, I believe this was from uh, Katya, who indicates that she submitted the required documents per the checklist and, and uh, has not heard back, uh, uh, presumably from the grant officer, in, in regard to the received funds. And in that instance, what we would, again, urge uh, you to do as well as others is to include a, a question about how to get in touch with your grant officer uh, in the AAQ, that is the CPF help desk and your question again will be uh, escalated so that management can then ensure that the grant officer gives you a response. We have a similar question uh, posed by um, Morgan, who indicates that their organization has already submitted the narrative and supporting docs. Can we tell Morgan, the time frame for them to anticipate hearing back? And I think the answer is it depends. Uh, Eileen has answered that question a few times before. I, would you like to elaborate, Eileen? Is Eileen still with us? She might not be able to unmute. Um, okay. Do you want to take that question? Yeah, I, I can take that. Yeah. So we, we don't, um, our, our division doesn't give a specified time frame for how long the reviews take simply because there's a lot of factors that go into the review. Um, different grant officers have different work, uh, not workflows, different, um, workloads. And sometimes grant packages take longer to review than others. So, um, I would recommend uh, if you've submitted materials and, and haven't heard back on, um, you know, whether it's approved or needs edits, uh, I would just, if possible, reach out to your grant officer for uh, for a further update because they'd probably be the best point of contact to give you an update since they're the ones reviewing your grant package. Eileen, did you have anything to add to that? No. No. I think she put, you put yourself in the anyway, but it, uh -oh. yeah, but I, I think, I think we got the, the gist. Yes. And let's see, uh, are there other questions, Chad? I was just double checking. I noticed uh, you placed into the chat the link so that folks who maybe don't have the slide deck yet um, can immediately go there. Yeah, but otherwise we've addressed all the questions that have come in in the chat so far. Oh, okay. we got one more. One more. Linda asks, where can I view what my organization has submitted? Uh, good question. I, I'm not, not sure that, that you can view it at, at present. HUD is developing a system that might provide information that will uh, give that status of, of the review, but Connor, do you want to take that question and, and indicate what is the, the, the present way to, if any, uh, uh, viewing what has been submitted? Oh my gosh, Connor can't unmute. No one can unmute. I'm We're so sorry. Technical <laughs> difficulty with, uh, with Zoom, it, it seems. Um, I'll, let's try to unmute him. Thanks. So there, there isn't a way to like, if, I mean, if you're referring to a portal to where you can see all your, your documents and in, in one place, we don't have that developed yet for FY23 grantees. So, uh, I mean, you should be keeping records of all of the documents that you create and submit via email to your grant officer. Um, of course you could always, again, ask your grant officer to see if they have a record of what you submitted to them, if you can't find it um, yourself for whatever reason. Yeah, Connor. Once the the grant application is approved and a and an agreement is signed, uh, the the circumstances might change because there there would would be information in in the the DRGR system, correct? Um, 
No, not necessarily. I mean, no. once a grantee gets access to DRGR, that's when the action plan submission is like setup process begins. And that's when you would take a lot of the information from your um, from your grant submission packet and use it to inform um, what you use to create your action plan. So, I mean, there, there, there will be basic grant information on your grant in there, like, you know, your grant number, the, the amount of, uh, of funds that you're authorized to use that sort of thing, but it won't be as specific. Like, it, like your, like your narrative and budget won't be, won't be pre-populated in, in DRGR. Once you access it, you'll have to, um, put that in yourself when you set up your action. Plan. But what they submit at the time, like you said, that, that would, they would have access to what they submit at, at that stage. Like the the action plan. Um, maybe maybe I'm getting confused on on exactly what's being asked. I mean, all all the documents you the grantee should have all the documents that that they're using and collecting to submit to the grant officer. Mm -hmm. Um, and the grant officer will will have those on there, and we our division will have a record of those documents. Um, if if. A, if a grantee needs to access those again. Uh, we got okay. a little bit of clarification from Linda. So she has a grant agreement with a number. Does that mean a narrative has already been submitted and approved? Is it a grant no. number? If it's just a grant number, that's how they're identified. Everybody has a grant number. When they start their process, they get a grant number. She says, I have a grant agreement with a number. OK. Is it an executed okay. grant an agreement? Executed, because because yeah. yeah. because every all grantees will receive a standard grant agreement that needs to be signed by both the organization and then eventually our division once the grant package has been submitted and fully approved. So every grantee has a grant agreement, but it's not executed until your submission is submitted, approved, um, and signed by us. I, I'm gonna make this suggestion when you get your um, email from the CPF mailbox that has your fully executed grant agreement. It's also gonna be your DRGR information. In your fully executed grant agreement is also your project narrative and your budget. And those are the pieces of information that you're gonna to need to set up your action plan, which is your um, approved project narrative and your budget. So if you use that, that can be your, your tool to move yeah. forward. That makes sense. Thank you, Connor and Eileen. We have a follow-up question or maybe it was a question uh, ra raised earlier, um, Jamie indicates our grant went through technical revisions, so the title changed. We use the updated title according to the technical revision, correct? I guess he's uh, saying, do we use the updated title according to the technical revision? Yes. Hold on to that letter. <laughs> <laughs> yes, hold Keep on to your that. records. I mean, exactly. I, I had I, that is the same question I had a grantee ask me yesterday because they wanted went underwent technical correction, and it was known as one thing. Then it went to so the it changed the use of the funds. They changed the title, and I said, you know, because we talk about this, like you're throughout the paperwork, we're like you use your JES statement, so you now have a new title. Use your new title. Hold on to your letter. If it ever gets questioned or there's a snag, you pop up that letter. And it's probably worth repeating uh, even a third time to hold on to that letter. If you go through the technical correction process, you're essentially you know, obtaining assistance in changing an act of Congress in a, in a technical way. And it takes a while. And you do not want to have to start that process all over again. Chad, do we have any other questions? We do. Um... MJ asks, is it possible to access funds for site studies to complete the NEPA review? Okay, do we need to unmute? Um, okay, so that or? comes under part 50, and that's got a programmatic waiver for environmental reviews. If you, um, I don't know if you guys have access to part 50, if you can pop that up or, um, if you talk to your environmental person, they can send you the part 50 section. And that isn't allowable. That's considered a soft cost. You can incur those costs, but you don't get reimbursed for them until you're under grant agreement because it's necessary to have an environmental review depending on the extent of your project. But they can get reimbursed for it. It's an eligible pre-award cost. 
it is an eligible pre-award cost, and that information is also addressed in your grant guide. I don't have the page number off the top of my head, but I could try and find it for you. Well, we actually have a slide, and I'm, I'm going to ask Chad if you go back to the slide that has the the CPF related uh, laws and regulations. If you can click on that link, it will bring up the environmental, uh, the, both part 58 and part 50. So just to be on the safe side, I would go and contact your field environmental officer. Give them your grant number, tell them who you are, tell them what you want to do, and they can give you that information and then you would have that as a record. Yes, and what's important to note is, is that it, what you're seeking to do would probably be an allowable pre-award cost, but you won't be able to reimburse your, you won't be able to advance yourself funds before that grant agreement is signed. You would have to sign the grant agreement and then set up the project in, in DRGR, the information system, and what is used necessarily for the disbursement of funds to then reimburse those costs. Is this the page you were looking for, Eileen? Well, if you look under- um, Part 58 at the bottom. It, not part, part 58. Part 50, I'm, part, I missed. Part 50. My, my apologies. Click on it. I, we have a little better, We we I would recommend- Go to the grant guide. Go to the grant guide. This is a little too techy. Yep. Um, but the grant guide will address that. And as you've stated, part 50 soft costs that are eligible. Oh, yes. Yeah. It contains that language. And that's what would be helpful to show. There it is right there. Uh, it's in the Q&A. Yep. That's part 50, 50 programmatic. Oh, here we go. Number two is this exact question. And the preceding question says, uh, prior to completion of the in environmental review grantees can incur eligible soft costs for planning and administration anytime after the date, date of enactment, which for your grants in the FY23 class was December 29, 2022. Correct. Hopefully that answers the question, MJ. And we have one more message. Oh, she thanks, he or she thanks us. Okay, good. And let's see. Oh, I lost my chat window. There it is. Um, I'm not seeing an additional question. I'm checking as well. Um, I, I do see there's a reference here to to the recording and there will be both the transcript and a link to a recording posted at the HUD exchange in the location where Chad navigated to uh, showing you the resources for FY23 grant awardees. Um, we've got a question on environmental clearance. Um, it says, if part of the project only requires environmental clearance, outdoor changes versus indoor changes, can we work to get a conditional approval to work on the needed part? I would not recommend that. I would recommend you speak with your environmental officer, explain to them the entirety of your project because what you may consider to be only an internal matter, there might be something else that gets triggered. So I would make sure that you get your project cleared in its entirety before undertaking any work. Yes. Sound advice, and it's appreciated by Shekhar. Okay, Chad, it looks like unless another question pops in as I speak, you can go back to the concluding slides. All right, so what's up next? We have office hours available. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to discuss your project or your narrative in depth, You'll have both Randall, myself, and HUD representatives available. 
to get some more in-depth um, discussion and troubleshooting. That's coming up next week on April 9th, same time, 2 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. And we welcome you to join us if you need some more help. And what's important to note there, uh, we, we haven't made this, this distinction very uh, plain <laughs> today, but uh, everyone will participate in the, the meeting in such a way where you can, will be invited to come off mute and and ask your question or offer further clarifying details. And to the extent time permits, uh, even kind of discuss your project narrative issues with us. The, so the entire panel, Chad, myself, and, and the HUD representatives, if time permits, you very well may even be invited to, to share any a written content that you would like to, to have us react to. Uh, this is more of a work session than, than a formal webinar. And we would welcome you, your active participation uh, next Tuesday, April 9th, uh, beginning at 2 p.m. Eastern. All right, so we do have a homework assignment. Yes, <laughs> you thought uh, I was Don't kidding. worry, <laughs> it's not too painful. Um, so what we're hoping that you can do is get ready for the next uh, cohort session, which is on budget. So coming out of this session, um, as you're finishing up your project narrative, make sure you're thinking about your entire the entire scope of your project. Because you're going to want to, for the budget, identify not only the CPF grant, but also any other sources of funding that are going to go into your project. And with that, you're going to be developing a detailed budget that covers all of the sources of funding and all of the things that you are spending it on. So if you can come to the budget session with that in mind, you will be off to a good start um, to have a, a productive cohort session. And that budget session is coming up on April 18th. And like Randall said at the top of the presentation, this is a four-part series. So uh, narrative is the first one. Then we've got budget, environmental, and forms. And it's probably important to note that each of those parts or sessions of this webinar series will have its own separate office hours too. So uh, if you do choose to uh, complete your homework assignment and gather the information for your budget, then you receive guidance on, on preparing that budget, there'll be an office hours section where you actually could, could share your, your budget and determine whether or not uh, it completely de describes the entirety of your project in a manner that is appropriate for a full project narrative and, and grant submission. It would be like, um, doing the work that would have prevented uh, maybe Bertram's gardens from encountering the issue that, that they faced. Uh, if they had similarly prepared in, a, in advance uh, at the time of making their request to the member of Congress, uh, the fact that they, they were in the process of, of acquiring land from uh, and, and were uh, raising money for that funding source and once that land was acquired, uh, they were then going to want funding to improve that complex associated with the, the fish hatchery, then it would have become uh, much more plainly evident to everyone involved in their project that that project received multiple sources of funding. And as such, when you hear descriptions of the budget, guidance, you'll hear representatives, panelists stress the importance of identifying all of the sources and uses of funds, especially the CPF funding grant use, all to correspond with the project narrative elements that Chad, Eileen, Connor, and I have gone over today.
All right, so here you have Randall and my email addresses. If you have any questions about the content of the presentation, don't hesitate to reach out. We're happy to be a resource for you. And the last piece of this is evaluations. Uh, HUD asks that participations com participants complete an evaluation of this course. Um, right after the meeting, you will get a link emailed out from cohorts at tdainc.org. And if you can just take a few minutes to tell us uh, how we did, how useful this was, um, be honest, brutal honesty is appreciated because we want this to be <laughs> as, uh, as informative and useful to you all as possible. Uh, if you wanna get started now, you can scan that QR code and, uh, and get going or wait for the email. Chad, and we with do that, we one, thank one you more, for attending. Uh, we do have one more question that, that has come in uh, and it's from Sherry who asked, how do we get added to the cohort? Um, yep, and I actually says, responded to Sherry with a, a private did. message. Um, oh, okay. We'll get her uh, all set up. All right. Yes, thank you all for your participation and we look forward to seeing you at, at office hours next Tuesday and hope you can attend the budget session the week after it. Goodbye. Bye-bye.